See, we sing that, but the question is, what is your anchor? What's your confidence anchored into? Right? Because you, you, your confidence has to stem from something. So when we sing that, I want you to mean that. Because you're saying, I will remain in the confidence of the Lord. So that means no matter what you go through, no matter where you are, no matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, no matter good or bad, the highs and the lows, the mountaintops and the valleys, I will remain. The Lord, that's my declaration. Lord, that's my declaration that I will remain in spite of. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity. Even through the worship experience, you are ministering to our hearts. You are ministering to our minds. That these aren't just lyrics for a song, but a place where we are educated and an understanding that we have to remain. We have to remain. Lord, we know that the world is watching us. So it's imperative that we remain in the confidence of the Lord. But knowing that it's anchored in an everlasting God. It's anchored in a consistent God. It's anchored in a God of yesterday, today, and forevermore. Never changing, Lord. Yeah, yeah. So Lord, we ask that you have your way throughout the rest of this service. We say thank you so much for who you are. You're a great God. You're a wonderful God. You're an amazing God. You're a loving God. And we say all this in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. And amen. amen. And amen. Come on, greet three people before you're seated. Bless them in the name of the Lord. One, two, three. You're funny. I greeted Pastor Jamal. That's that qualifies for greeting three people. <laughs> I just want to not nice. Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> what is that you have in your hand? This yeah. For you know, this is a reminder. <laughs> All right, because I want to say thank you for celebrating my birthday last week. Thank you, congregation. Thank you for our spiritual family. Those of you that are here. Uh, those of you that are joining us from wherever you are across the country, around the world, across the street. I always got to <laughs> throw that staff, in. Staff. The staff um, was created behind this. Yeah, that's it. Ideas. The staff. And that song is so special to me because it's a constant reminder for me of what this is all about. And it comes from an old album, Walter Hawkins' uh, album, that song. And it was just so good. So those of you that, that were here last week and got hold of that song, and they did a great job with the collage, and then coming out with the voices. It was fantastic. And, and the individuals saw were just random, well, not random, those were members from CCC just getting a chance to say happy birthday. Very rarely do, we, do they get the chance to express their love and gratitude. So we said, let's grab some people in the lobby and, you know, from all the different campuses and just have them say happy birthday. Yeah, that was nice. That was really nice. Um, happy birthday from the community. Yes. From the family uh, of faith. And we don't have a pastor's aid committee. Uh, some of you used to go to that church. <laughs> Raise your hand if you used to go to that church. Okay, so you know about that. Yeah, and a, and a pastor aid Sunday or something like that. No, um, you know, we, we celebrate our leadership with specific opportunities throughout the year, and one of them is um, the birthday. So thank you. Uh, family for loving this ministry and loving your leadership. And I, I, and I want to give a shout out uh, two cards, because I sit down and I read all these cards. I'm sorry. We read all these cards. <laughs> Y'all are laughing because you know I'm talking about Pastor Karen. Ooh, let me see that? Okay, good. And, and I love this one, so I want to give a shout out to Sister Sinclair. Uh, and it says, Age ain't nothing but a number. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Sinclair, for that birthday card. And I thought this one was really special. This was, this was, this was I mean, they wrote a long 
um, letter inside, but this is from one of our CCCI, Samantha Campbell, because she sent me a card with a fist that popped out and said, boom. <laughs> Not bam, boom. Yeah, I was shaking. And I, want, I brought that for you. <laughs> I want you to have that. Oh. So what did you do for your birthday? Huh? What did you do for your birthday? I know they, they want to know. I enjoyed my new motorcycle. <laughs> so I... But you're not, uh, you're not, you're not, you're not supposed I got to a it. Harley Iron 883 for my birthday, which is a nice cruiser, cafe cruiser, and... Add to my collection, and I'm enjoying can we, it. Can we strike that from the record? Take that off the. Oh, the insurance video. people might yes. be watching. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I rode my pedal bike. And, uh, <laughs> we've had a great day. Thank you for that. <laughs> Good looking out. I got you. <laughs> C3. Yes. You were this week and took some friends of of your son, my grandson, down to um, Pennsylvania. It was camp. You know, about 170, 175 kids, if I'm counting correctly. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Uh, CCC, that was possible because of, like I said, the sponsorship was at an all-time high. Mm -hmm. A lot of the parents uh, sponsored other kids because one parent I felt bad for her. She was like, you know, my kid can't come. I have five kids. And I, me understanding, I have five kids also. Uh, like, we have to do a staycation because flights are not nice to me. <laughs> a staycation. So, okay. Yeah, I understand the struggle. And um, it was an amazing time to see the progression of, of, of kids. And, and some of the parents, uh, one, one young lady said, my, my mother just told me, I'm going on a trip, didn't tell me where, didn't tell me what I'm doing. And so I packed what I packed. And she ended up at a camper trip with bunk beds with a bunch of other uh, youth. With a what? <laughs> on bunk beds with a bunch of other youth. Okay. And <laughs> her attire wasn't the best, but... To God be the glory, uh, her heart attire was changed. And it was nice. She went from a, a stoic face to smiling, interacting. God really moved. You could see the transformation of these individuals from day one by, you know, day five. Yeah. And it was amazing from, you know, praise and worship was like this to this. And it was, it was powerful. It was just powerful to see that happening. And I, I heard the kids didn't want to leave. They didn't nope, want, they to, didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay like, there. One more day. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to leave. <laughs> you were ready. You were ready to go home. <laughs> yes. And, and the thing about it is watching the transformation of, of young people because yes. they come in influenced by the culture with attitude and a way of dressing and all the stuff that culture dumps on them and they embrace and unfortunately sometimes conform to. So to see them go through a transformation just by being in a context where Christ is exalted and that means that the way you are has to change, you know, and then to see them change in just a few days that is very, very special. So kudos to our leadership team. Team did an excellent uh, job. Our staff who make it all possible, who sacrifice their time yeah. and, and their children. And kudos to you for subsidizing some of the trip. We subsidized it? Yes, we did. You'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good because we talked about being wired and... Um, I talked about, you know, what does it look like to be connected. Um, Reggie ministered about, you know, the disconnection. Uh, Pastor Adam ministered about, you know, the, the carrying a veil, getting rid of the veil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it was, just, it was just a week's worth of just encouraging them. Because one of the things that we run into, the, you know, is, you know, we have a week with them. But inevitably, they have to go back, back into the environment. You know, some of the households, oh, man, parents, we got to hold each other accountable. I, hearing some of the stories of these youth... And the, the way these parents are acting and carrying out, I told, you know, one parent was saying, well, I take care of them. I said, D describe that. Are you, you know, are you, t oh, I, you know, provide for them. They got food. They got clothing. I said, yeah, but are you speaking, are you, are you taking care of the whole child? Right? Not just those aspects. I said, you got to speak, speak to the whole child. Where are, where are they emotionally? Where are they mentally? Where are they spiritually? You got to speak to the whole child. Just because they got food on the table doesn't mean you're doing a good job. Come on. Come on. Yeah. 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 
uh, has to be a holistic raising yes. of our children. You have to deal with them spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, motivationally, and materially. Yep. That is part of what we create in legacy, and that is how we have to train up a child in the way that it should go. So that's excellent. So we have to have a retreat for the parents. Yeah, seriously. Yes. Hey, good. <laughs> we'll be announcing a parent retreat. Seriously. Seriously. Because they, they don't know. They're doing the best they can. And we, we noticed a significant number of single parent households mm -hmm. where mothers are doing their best. Yes. You know, and this is where we as the church, as the community of faith can come in and help to shore that up and help to make up the difference. Yep. So that's important. Excellent. Write that down. Whoever's supposed to write stuff down. I got it. You I got it? Yep. Okay. Staff. All right. Cool. Um, anything else before we go into... Oh, I like that. Uh, if Jesus preached the same message ministers preach today, he would never have been crucified. Ooh. Unpack that. Oh, man. Do we have time to unpack that? <laughs> the mini version. Uh, the reality is We treat that... you like the politicians. You got three minutes. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> the reality is that uh, the ch church has tried so hard to create a gospel that is palatable uh, and not convicting. Um, and and they, they have taken the, the job of the Holy Spirit and feel like they can impress these kids with outfits and good, cool songs. And, you know, and they, they have taken out the core message of the gospel and put it to the side, thinking that they can get these individuals, get them saved, but they, never, they forget to bring the core gospel back in. You know, a, a, a life of, uh, uh, beyond circumspect, a life that, that really, no, this is a life style that you have to change. Mm. Right, people looking at you. There, there is, there, there is a line that has to be crossed, that has to be drawn in the sand. It says, no, this is, this is. There, there is a line, and they have, you know, taken a foot and they went like this with the line and tried to move it this way. And it's like, no, God drew the line. It says, no, Christians, this is how you got to live. This is how you got to act. This is the gospel of the message. So, it's not about adding Jesus to your lifestyle. It's allowing Jesus to revolutionize that lifestyle. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the chain. When yep. he said, I am the way, the mm -hmm. truth, and the life, because the culture is trying to impose its way, its truth, its life on our society and our young people yep. especially. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Romans, Rome, you know Romans 12. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's important mm -hmm. because this, this generation is trying to figure out how and if they can fit God into yeah. their lifestyle mm -hmm. and into their schedule. Yeah, when you have a, a generation of ministers that look like celebrities. Look and act like. Yep, look and yeah. act like celebrities. Uh, you, 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 uh, Donna McClurkin said it the best to me. He says, whenever your transparency of, as a minister competes with the gospel, you're a violation. So opening yourself up. Mm -hmm. I got it. I got it. Not everybody's mature enough to handle that. Right, right. Yeah, it's true. There should be this rapport. And also, um, as, I, as I get a chance to hear some of the ministers that are, that are out there, especially, you know, your generation of ministers, um, they don't want to be judged um, at the higher level that they should be judged yep. at. So they'll point out, well, you guys get away with so many things and you don't want to be judged, but you'll turn around and judge me um, in, 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 in my capacity and they feel that that's not fair. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Scripture is clear that when you take on leadership in the kingdom of God, you are held to a higher level of accountability and a higher level of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're going to lead people who are doing things you can't do. Yeah. <laughs> and people that, you know, will excuse themselves and yet hold you accountable, and they should. Because if you don't want to be held at a higher accountability level as a leader, then you shouldn't be a leader. Mm-hmm. 
you know, James, book of James said so beautifully, he said, not many of you should want to be teachers because teachers are held to a higher standard. And we should be held to a higher moral standard, spiritual standard across the board. Uh, and yet some of these leaders don't want to be held with them. I get to minister to a lot of high profile people, whether they're in entertainment, in government, in education, in finance, in sports, and I get invited to a lot of their events, and I kindly refuse. And here's why. Because if I enter that mix, I reduce myself to a peer level and lose my spiritual and moral authority. And I've seen pastors do that. I've seen ministers do that and then wonder. You can't go bar hopping with someone that you're trying to Minister. help. Yep you know, change their life and turn their life around. You, 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 there has to be a distinction. There has to be a separation. So if you want to be one of the boys, um, especially if you're an and that's why everybody can't handle leading leaders and leading celebrities and leading entertainers because it's easy for that, that, that whole ethos to creep up on you. Next thing you know, you want to be, you want to be a celebrity. Yep. No, no. Uh, people should be celebrated, but the, the kingdom... It's a different level of responsibility and a level of sacrifice. Yep. So there has to be something different between those who take the mantle of leadership. And unfortunately, too many leaders are staining the cloth. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. And Jesus, he, he, he didn't go with the flow. He, he said, he... <laughs> he had certain convictions. Yeah, he was flipping tables. standards and values. I like that. So, uh, another thing that we have to do, uh, last week, Dr. David Island, how many were blessed by his ministry? Mm -hmm. He brought an incredible word. Um, but pastorally, I must uh, address the prophetic that was engaged in. And in the first service, it was just amazing, the prophetic gift that was in him, because he was spot on uh, in the things that he had to say to our leaders I know them personally, I know where they are, I know what their experiences uh, are, and he was just spot on. Then in the second service, uh, where you, you may not have seen it, he made an altar call for one thing, and a lot of people came up. And I get it, you know, when the, when the gifts of the Holy Spirit begin to manifest in a service, and this is what you really can't experience at home, <laughs> uh, but as the... <laughs> gifts of the Holy Spirit begin to manifest in the context of the service, the dynamic of the service changes. Mm -hmm. And while I'm watching, I'm balancing the prophetic and the pastoral. All right? Um, because those two things have to be in balance. Anything taken to the extreme becomes error. Um, so what can also happen is if people don't understand those manifestations, they can become confused about what's going on in front of them. Even whether it's those who are watching or those who are actually up here participating. So um, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about that to help you understand it uh, as a congregation, how we respond to that and what the scripture has to say to that. Um, so I, I, I want to reflect on that because some of the prophetic word that he gave um, was spot on. And then some of it left some people in confusion because it wasn't them. They couldn't bear witness fully to what was being said. And in some uh, instances, um, he was picking up someone that, some, that they were burdened for and not them. So there is a dynamic that takes place when the Holy Spirit is sensitizing an individual who has a gift and, when, and that's why whenever you're being used by God, especially in the prophetic, you have to walk in humility. Mm -hmm. Because humility makes you remember that you're an instrument of God and that it's part God and part you. You, the who you are as a person, what you bring to the table, does not sit down while the Holy Spirit is using you. No, that part of you also tries to voice itself even in the process. And that's why when it comes to the prophetic, 
you know, there's certain responsibilities that come with that. And we, we're going to tackle that because I want to equip you pastorally in my response to what I witnessed in the second service. First service was, was okay. So maybe I, maybe they don't need to hear it because <laughs> it was just a second service. Don't do that to them. I got you. You, you want to know? Yes. You're just nosy looking. <laughs> yeah, but let me, so that you know how to respond when these things happen, because I love the prophetic. It's an important part of ministry, but you need to know what your responsibility is when this particular manifestation, when this particular gift is manifested within the context. So um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 14, 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is where we are. And I just want to, and it was just beautiful in terms of how it blessed the people collectively, but also individually, but there was another reality to it, and that is it leaves questions. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, and Lord, just add a blessing to the reading of your word, to the study of your word. Touch our hearts and minds to be open and receive. Teach us to hear your voice. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm reading from the, oh man, this is the, let me switch. I want to read from the English Standard ESV version, which tends, it, but not is, it, it is considered the most accurate and readable translation that we have in our midst right now, the ESV, and translations of the Bible, that's a whole nother story. Um, but ESV, it says, it reads, verse one, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Did you hear this? All right. What should you pursue? Why? Because love should rule any spiritual gift in manifestation. That goes for the spirit of the manifestation of any gift and the attitude of the person being used to administer that gift. Because the gifts of the spirit are not for the individual being used. It's for the people that God will minister to through that gift. So it's not for you to make you look spiritual. <laughs> yeah. Pursue love, because love is foundational to any manifestation of God. That's his nature, and that should govern what takes place. And earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, right? Especially that you may prophesy. And, and I'm going to, without going through all of this, ex respond to that, especially that you may prophesy. Why? Because the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is about order within the worship service. And Paul emphasizes that prophecy, and he contrasts prophecy with speaking in tongues, all right, speaking in other tongues. He says that prophecy is more geared towards ministering to the collective body than the individual, even though it does speak to both. Paul's concern pastorally, all right, and apostolically is that you understand the significance of, prof of the prophetic because it's primarily designed to speak to the collective body of people in any given context. So Paul says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Then he gets into speaking in tongues, and I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to address that separately at another time yeah. so that you know, because we get a lot of questions yeah. around that. Because like the fact is, if, I'm not, if I don't speak in tongues, I'm not saved. That is a doctrine mm -hmm. that is not biblical, but mm -hmm. there are those who have tried to make it biblical and theological. Um, that is one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but not the only evidence of your salvation. Mm -hmm. All right, and there are doctrines that make it the evidence of your salvation. And that's that's, did, did that's Jesus incorrect. Speak, did Jesus speak in tongues? Hmm? Did Jesus speak in tongues? Did Jesus speak in tongues? 
Uh, the only time I witnessed that he spoke in tongues <laughs> is when he said, Eloi, Eloi, lachmach sabatanai. <laughs> my God, my God, yes. why has thou forsaken me? Otherwise, he spoke Aramaic and Hebrew that I know of. So. Anyway, um, for one who speaks in an... Un, in, in, wow, I, yeah, I, this is all about mostly... All right, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. So the prophetic is not just predictive to the future and analytical to the present, as you've heard me say often. It is also for the purpose of encouragement, building up, which is edification, and consolation, which is comfort. So exhortation, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Mm -hmm. All right? The prophetic. Because, all right, we'll get into the detail. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So the prophetic is geared toward the collective body to build, to encourage, to strengthen, to comfort, as well as talk about the future you know, when you talk about signs of the times, and also offer analysis spiritually and morally of what's going on right now in our society. Verse 5, Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets, because tongues with interpretation equals prophecy. Mm -hmm. So the church may be built up. Again, Paul is emphasizing the building of the collective body, not the individual. Now, brothers, if you come to, if, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp uh, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? So Paul is talking about making sure that people understand what's going on in the midst of all of this. And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So Paul's concerned about your understanding, our understanding as a body of believers in the face of spiritual manifestations or manifestations of spiritual gifts. So I don't want to read the whole thing, but let me just share with you uh, some very important points that you need to take down. How many are writing? Amen? Yeah, you come to CCC. This is about learning. Remember, spiritual growth and development, growth and development in life, period, is about study and reflection. Mm -hmm. Study and reflection. Study and reflection. So... What does the scripture say? Pursue the prophetic, right? Pursue love, but also desire spiritual gifts. And I, and I love the word pursue there in the Greek in another translation it, it, because it means be open to prophecy. Don't forbid it. And there are places that forbid that. They say that that doesn't work anymore in today's world. We are Pentecostal, charismatic, evangelical by by our, our cultural context and the character of this ministry. We embrace these things. We believe that they're present and active today. So desire, I pursue love, but desire spiritual gifts among them, which is the prophetic. Be open to prophecy, all right? Don't dismiss it and say, no, God's not doing that anymore. You tell God what he's not doing anymore, he'll do it just to show you up. <laughs> all right? Uh, number two. Number two, prophecy is, as I said, predictive to the future, analytical to the present, but also speaks a word of edu uh, edification. To strengthen, listen to this, edification. Edify means to build up. And the purpose is to strengthen and confirm what God is doing in a person's life. So prophecy, prophecy in terms of edification, seeks to confirm what God is already speaking to you. If you get a prophetic word that is foreign to everything that you have been uh, intimately interacting with God about, you have a responsibility to check that carefully. Because the first thing that the prophetic does in its edification is to confirm or bear witness to something God is already speaking to you into your heart. Mm -hmm. Got it? It comes to bring understanding. Uh, exhortation. And the prophetic... Uh, it, it manifests for exhortation. And exhortation simply means to, to, someone, to summon someone to service of the divine will. So when 
God spoke to some, through Dr. Ireland, you know, to some of our, our elders, he was calling them up to another level of service, uh, another season of service in their life. It was just so beautiful how that was done. And lastly, to comfort. To comfort means to ease grief and stress. So the prophetic can speak to things in your life, and that word from God lessens or removes the grief that you're going through or the stress that you're going through because of something you may not understand or desire to know, and then God speaks it to you. And the prophetic happens not just in the, in the church service. The manifestation of the gifts of God can happen at any time, mm -hmm. right? So this morning, um, I'm driving in, and the Lord gives me a word for a young pastor that I'm mentoring. So, uh, using Siri, <clears throat> I recorded my notes and then sent him a text of what God spoke to me, that word. He, me not immediately, I will say within about two minutes, he sent me a text back and he said, Rev, Rev you have no idea. And he's pastoring a church in Brooklyn and he said, you have no idea. I just came out of uh, prayer, and then I got your text. And in prayer, I was asking God the how to do what he's asked me to do, commissioned me to do. And then your text hit it spot on. Mm -hmm. And I was just obeying the voice of the Lord, right? But for him, it was a prophetic word answering a question that he was wrestling with as a pastor. And that word brought him uh, a relief of stress and a relief from the grief that he was going through. Do you understand how these gifts, a little bit of how these gifts are made to work. Number three, Paul emphasizes that the prophetic is mostly to edify the collective body of believers as opposed to the individual, which as I said, all, uh, said already. The prophetic also in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 Verse 24, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. And Paul is contrasting speaking in tongues with the prophetic because the prophetic tends to be in the language common to that particular con congregational context, right? So when someone else comes in who is an unbeliever and they're witnessing this and they hear the prophet revealing things about personal things about the individual's life, that has a convicting power to those who are now witnessing, not understanding this, or not believing. Uh, so Paul says, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outside, outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. So it's a witness to the presence and power of God. Um, amen? Got that? So the prophetic can reveal the secrets of our hearts. And sure enough, there were certain things that God was comfortable enough to reveal through the use of the prophetic gift that was uh, active uh, last week. But here is very critical um, that I want you to get out of it. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. 14, 29. Are you there? 1 Corinthians 14, 29. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. The word weigh means to take under consideration, to think critically, to judge. We have a responsibility to judge whatever prophetic word is given to us. That's why after Dr. Ireland did what he did, I stood up and I said, I want to say that I know these individuals. I know each of their lives. And what you said to them, Dr. Ireland, was spot on. I waited, I judged it, I could bear witness to it and affirm it in the lives of our leaders who he had up front. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others do what? Come on. Way. Let the others do what? Right. Which means to judge. When you weigh something, you're thinking critically about what you've heard or what you experience. You have a responsibility to do that. There is something in the Bible called false prophets who prophesy imagination of their own heart saying God said. 
And because that is possible, right, God says we have a responsibility to judge whatever we hear prophetically, especially if it's inconsistent with what God has been saying to you personally and individually. Do you all get that? Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. Listen to him. <laughs> so the prophetic can reveal the secrets of our heart, but prophecy must be judged. Paul emphasizes, what Paul emphasizes is order and not confusion. Additionally to the responsibility to weigh and judge whatever prophetic utterance you hear, all right, First, keep, you must also keep this in mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. You ready? Love never ends. As for, as for prophecies, they will what? Pass away. And the Old Testament says, how do you know if a prophet is a prophet? If what they said comes true. Mm -hmm. Isn't that simple? And if what they say doesn't come true, then you have the responsibility to say, well, you weren't prophetic on that one. That wasn't God. <laughs> that wasn't God. There's a wonderful book uh, called The Elijah Principle. And the whole book basically says that God allows the prophet to be correct twice and wrong once. Just to remind <laughs> him that it's God and not him. <laughs> and I think that's a good rule. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Verse 9. For we know in part. And we, come on, we what? Prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, which means it's not here yet, the partial will pass away. What is the, what the scripture saying? Our knowledge is fragmentary and incomplete. So no matter what spiritual gifts are in manifestation, we are still limited. God is the only one that's omniscient, mm -hmm. all-knowing, all right? And the fact that we prophesy in a fragmented way with partial knowledge, it means that there is also the activity of our own mind and reasoning that come, come into play. So I take prophecy very seriously. You should too. But let this be a guide a framework for you whenever you're experiencing the prophetic. I don't care where it is. Because if someone comes up to you and says, you know, the Lord spoke to me about you. Okay, God <laughs> does that. Let me hear what you got to say so I can weigh whether I bear witness that it is from God. And truth bears witness to truth. Mm -hmm. The spirit of truth bears witness to the spirit of truth in us. Amen? Yes. Very, did you get anything out of that? Come on, give God a good and, and, and clap offering for his, for his yeah. word. Write that statement down because it's a, it's a, a key statement. Truth bears witness to truth. Mm. And mm. one day I'm going to ask Pastor to unpack that because it's a lot being said right there. Yeah, how that happens. Because we're going to start a series today that we're going to carry out for the next couple of weeks and after that, it's going to lead to Jesus' statement, my sheep hear my voice. What does that mean? Can I tell you how many Christians wrestle with that? Mm -hmm. How do I hear God's voice? Is it an audible voice that I hear from out in space? Or, <laughs> you know, what, what does that mean? And we want to bring clarity to that. But our text to start off with is found in Matthew chapter 16, um, hold it, yeah, let me, where are we here? Oops, love technology, as long as it cooperates. Matthew 16, beginning at verse 1. You and I were talking about the signs of the times. Yes. And there's a lot of conversation about it. And this comes up cyclically, seasonally almost. And I think um, uh, covid brought it up even at a different level where the normal individual weren't talking about it. But now all the stuff that happened during the year, not just COVID, but... Uh, the election? The election, the... Uh, racial issues, the racial issues, eruptions. Even you know, looking at the, the crop issue that was happening with the, the lotuses and things like that, which was a phenomenon. And so people started asking, you know, are we in the end times? How do we know we're in the end times? What are the end times? And this has been a constant conversation, really from 2020. Okay, so 
Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 2, verse 17. All right, write that down. Because very you, important. You, you know you got the dispensational list really running home with this stuff. The dispensational list? Yes. Yeah, I know. Trying to force, and I believe in dispensationalism in that God administrates his will and purposes uh, dispensationally, which simply means periods of time mm -hmm. in which he's dealing with human society and in human history in specific ways, whether it's you know, beginning with conscience, whether it's under human government, under the law of Moses, under grace, the church age, they're all periods that God is dealing with human history and, you know, humans. Um, so, yeah, this is a conversation that comes up as a result of all that we've gone through and also the changes that are taking uh, place. You had asked me about a statement that I made. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it was, um, you said that that the cyclical forces are going to converge like we haven't seen them before uh, in the next 10 years, right? So you, you were saying that these next 10 years, there's going to be some cyclical ah, ah, things that's going to okay. be happening. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's going to be, what I said was, over the next 10 years, we're going to see a convergence mm -hmm. of cyclical, cyclical forces that we haven't seen in our nation in about a hundred years. Mm -hmm. So that's true. Uh, and there's certain things that are happening. The housing market change, the volatility of the stock market, um, the, the increasing uh, interest rates, um, um, inflation, which is, um, you know, uh, rising prices of goods and services. Um, what does that all mean? Is it prophetic? Is it significant? And Jesus said, look, these things have been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. What's different about it? Jesus said, when it begins to happen with greater frequency and intensity, that's a sign. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? We've had earthquakes throughout history. Yep. We've had tsunamis, you know, tsunamis, hurricanes, all these climate change. Inflation, depression. Jesus, we, we, we've had economic cycles, political cycles, social cycles, all of this. I can imagine how people were in Rome when they were going through what they were going through. Like, yeah. are, they, are these the end times okay? <laughs> because of the, the decline of Rome? Well, let's, let's, get, let's get Acts chapter seven, Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 17 up there. And there are three forces at work. Yeah, and I want to ask you about one uh, you want to, why don't you write the three? Why don't you go to the board? You want me to write on the board? Go to the board. That Jesus t-shirt you got on. <laughs> this board is a little low for me, so I got to... Acts chapter 17. Look at this while he's doing that. All right? And in the what? And it, I can't hear you. It's up on the screen or, in your, or in, on your device or on your Bible paper. And in the what? So Acts chapter 2 is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? They're in the upper room. They're waiting for the promise of the Father that Jesus talked about. He said, tarry in Jerusalem. I have King James language. Stay in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. Then you'll be witnesses for me. And you're going to go local and then out into the rest of the world, right? Jerusalem, Judea, other most parts of the earth. King James language again. But notice what he says. And in the last... So, the, the question was to the audience, all right, or should I say from the audience, you know, what is going on here? The, the, the Holy Spirit rushes in like a mighty wind, tongues of fire rest upon it. It's a visible and physical experience at the same time, uh, an invisible experience at the same time. And the question is, what's going on here? What is this? Mm -hmm. And then Peter stands up, and beginning at verse 17, he responds with his, a very powerful sermon. And how does he open it up? And in the last days, God declares that I will what? Pour out my spirit, spirit the Holy Spirit, on all, all flesh. flesh, all of humanity, which means the spirit is going to be active in human society in different ways. Different for the believer, 
who is in relationship with Jesus and different for the unbeliever who is not in relationship with God through Christ. But all of humanity is going to experience the presence and power and ministry and work of the Holy Spirit. Too often we, we, we say it's, he, he's only working in the church. No, God forbid. Thank God he's not. God has a plan that he's moving <laughs> along and the Holy Spirit. He will convict the world of sin. Mm -hmm. Not the church, but the world. So he's going to be active in the church, but he's also going to be, amongst believers, he's also going to be active in the world amongst unbelievers. All right? So the Holy Spirit is not limited to just our context and our environment. No. So where'd the verse go? Okay. It expired? Okay. <laughs> And in the last days, uh, it shall be, God declares, that I will, pour out my, of my, of, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and then your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and then you know the rest of it. But what I want you to pay attention to, go back, uh, I want you to pay attention to, in the last days. So what the, apostle, what the apostle Peter was saying, he was announcing, this is the beginning of the last days. The, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this particular dispensation or this period, right, was announced by the prophet Joel in Joel chapter 2 that this is what's going to happen when the last days are initiated by God. That's very, very important because people use language like, is this the last days? We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. <laughs> We've been in the last days since... The day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago. Do you all hear that? When did the last days start? The day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost. That's been 2,000 years we've been in the last days. And I won't get into the whole idea of days, 1,000 years. No. But no. So when people start saying, is this the last days? It's been the last days. <laughs> and then we get into language like, well, it must be the last of the last days. <laughs> there was no prophetic utterance about the last of the last. <laughs> or, or, or they will say, well, we must be in the end of the last days. Which is, has a degree of legitimacy because we are seeing things take place that Jesus spoke about with greater frequency and greater intensity. Got it? So that's a hint that this particular period in human history is coming to a close. All right? Now, back in 1975, when I got saved, they said Jesus was coming soon. And I had to realize soon is not as soon as I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And then you have Y2K. Because there's God's soon and there's our soon. For me, soon was in two weeks. Yep. And then they got the Mayan calendar. You didn't show up. Yeah, all of these <laughs> factors come into play. <laughs> All right, so, so, you know, this is important. Oh, right, did you, what did you write? Okay, random, okay, yeah. Because you say if it's cyclical, how is it random? Uh, you know, it's because of how we think. Mm -hmm. So when we think of time, right, and, 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 and history, we think of it in, in linear terms mostly. So it's like, here's the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And then... Time begins, and we believe that there's going to be an end. So we think of it in a linear fashion. I spoke about this on uh, Easter Sunday in my Easter message about the gift of change. So we think of it in a linear fashion. But after the flood, that cataclysmic event, Genesis 8.22, what does God say to Noah and his family? He says, as long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed time and harvest time, yep. right? Hot and cold, day and night. In other words, all of the systems that are in place will continue, guarantee. Why? Because they depended on those systems. They were an agrarian society. They were concerned about their crops and agriculture, and they depended on the, the cycles of seasons, etc. So time is cyclical. It's cycles, and those cycles are going on continuously and repeating themselves over and over throughout human history. So, yes, we are moving in a progression towards a very specific end of this particular age in human history. So, yeah, it's linear in that we're moving, we're progressing. 
And there are those who want to argue that, because especially if you believe in, um, oh, man. You got to give me some more hints. <laughs> I want to help you. I want to help you. <laughs> you want, I know you want to help me. <laughs> especially if you believe in, in reincarnation. Oh, yes. Because reincarnation enters I, I the cycle. I wasn't thinking about that at all. Right? So we don't go there, by the way. Yeah, because I have to ask. So what, what, it's cyclical. But within history... And within those cycles, there are random events that occur. There are random events that occur that are not part of the cycle, but an eruption within the cycle, an eruption within the linear progression of time. So what PJ wrote on here, random simply means signs of the times is when we, when we see random events taking place that are an expression of what's happening within the culture. All right? So you take a mass shooting. Mm -hmm. the, the mass shooting that took place in Buffalo, the most recent, and in Texas. Uvalde, right? In Texas. These were young men, right? Not necessarily with any particular background, but motivated by certain things happening within the culture. It was random. It was not part of some cycle of violence. No, yeah, it's within the cycle of violence, but it's random in that it occurred in a way that we um, don't comprehend and can't necessarily plan for when these things happen. Amen? So there are things that happen randomly which means that they're beyond our comprehension and beyond our control. How many agree that there are things that happen random, randomly that are beyond our control and often beyond our comprehension? And we try to figure out why did that happen like that? Uh, eruption, and, and, and these are eruptions that can take place motivated by fear of the things that are coming, and this is what makes it a sign, because one young man was motivated by his fear of what he sees changing in American society, especially around issues of race. Mm -hmm. So when people see, certain people see the society's changing and they're no longer dominant or in a position of power or influence, fear comes in. And Jesus spoke to this, and we're going to unpack this in Signs of the Times. You want to do that? Amen? All right. So, so when we think of, 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 of cycles of, of influence or, or cyclical forces, if I can use that language, right? They are random because they occur uh, randomly and they're beyond our control and um, beyond our comprehension often. We try to make sense of these things that happen random. Um, and, and they're cyclical when we can determine that they, they will come around again and again and again. So random forces are occurrences of events beyond our control and our comprehension, such as the mass shooting that, that, that are eruptions, right? And, and notice, when they dug a little deeper, one of the guys concerned because uh, people of color are taking over the nation. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are legitimately concerned. I mean, let's go to Luke chapter 21, verse 26. Luke 21, 26. Because in Luke 21, Jesus is talking about the future and what the signs of the times will be and what the climate of human society will be like. And notice what he says. Let's, let's go to verse 25. Are you there? Oh, man, we're out of time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's 9.54. Can we finish this? <laughs> you handle all the scheduling. So I <laughs> have to get permission. Yes. <laughs> All right, Luke 21, 25. <laughs> Jesus says, and there will be signs. What? Signs. Signs. Where? In sun, moon, and stars. And we're going to talk about that and what that really means. doesn't mean the sun and the moon are going to fall out. Let me tell you, look, if the, food, if the moon fell to the earth, it's over. <laughs> the sun won't even get a chance to get here. <laughs> so it must be symbolic language. And we have to understand what it symbolizes, right? But notice, on, on the earth, distress of nations. 
in perplexity. Why? Because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. Now, that's not talking about the ocean. That's also symbolic language. So don't think that because there's a tsunami that, ah, that's it. That's the roaring of the seas and the waves. No, no. That language speaks of tumult and upheaval within American, American, <laughs> within, within human society. All right? So that's what it's talking about. But look at verse 26. People fainting with what? Fear and with foreboding. And foreboding simply means an expectation that bad things are going to happen. It could be both, good or bad, but primarily bad things are going to happen. All right? Uh, so people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. So that's a very broad expression of the fact that people are going to be looking at what's going on around them. And they're going to be reacting in different ways. And many are going to be fearful, thinking that things are being so changed right, that there is no longer any room for them or life as they have known it and experienced it for so long. Mm -hmm. And they're going to react. Some of those reactions will be random. Some of them will be part of the political and social and spiritual and moral cycles and forces that are at work, all right? And some of those reactions are linear. And when we talk about linear, we're talking about providential movement of history because linear refers to God moving history along towards a very specific goal and objective. So should we unpack this? They're saying yes. Should we unpack this? Should we unpack this? Because I was going to just go into talk about the signs of the times in Matthew 16. So we'll, we'll unpack that. We'll get into greater detail. Because it'll equip you for conversation and understanding. And let me see this. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. That's not us. All right? But the spirit of what? Power. Love. Love. Love and of a sound mind. So we don't freak out. You heard that you say Pastor Jamal faith? emphasized the song, our confident, we are confident in him. Right? That's where our confidence lies. So as we talk about these things and unpack these things, we'll look at it socially, politically, economically. We're going to look at that. But these are the signs of the times. And these are all prophetic indicators that emanate from the character of the culture. That is the random and cyclical forces at work, but we're going to look at the linear forces, which is what God is doing. God is, how many know God's hand is in history? And he's making certain things happen. Often when something happens within society that baffles us because it's so foreign to where we are, it's, 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 it's an anachronism. You all know what that is, right? <laughs> so these come up every now and then. Something that's just out of time. It just, it doesn't fit. It doesn't belong here. It could be the assassination of a president like Kennedy, the attempted assassination of a president like Ronald Reagan within a spe specific period of time since Kennedy, which makes it a cyclical occurrence. War, all of those things. We're going to unpack it, take a look at that. And most importantly, it's not all that information, but understanding where you fit in the grander scheme of things. That's important because when God, when Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah and Lot, what did he mean by that? What was Noah's experience? What was Lot's experience? Because what Jesus was pointing to was not only the condition of the culture, but the condition of his people in the culture. Yep. And we've got to look at that. Amen? Amen. So, I'm going to stop here. I'm glad you started this. <laughs> but we'll continue. Did you get anything? I know there's a lot today. But did you get anything out of this? Praise the Lord. And now our own minister, Misha Field, is going to come and share with you here, but especially those of you who are watching by way of internet. Let us give God praise. <laughs> Beloved, we close every service by saying that Jesus is Lord, but we can't do that without giving someone the opportunity to make him Lord. 
Praise God that he makes all things new. Praise God that he can turn water into wine and apparently a Harley into a bicycle for insurance purposes. We can give him praise for that. Praise God when a community with one voice can come together to worship him and when a community with one voice can come together and celebrate and affirm those who lead them. Praise God for a chosen vessel willing to preach on popular truths even if rejection and persecution result. Praise God for the accountability that forces us to mature and that his word will not return to him void. Pastor talked about the power of the prophetic to exhort, to comfort, and to convict. Truth bears witness to truth. We bear witness to his word. God bore witness to Christ, and the world will bear witness to change. And that is good news. Amen. The good news is that a holy God so loved a rebellious world that he sent his only begotten son to live a sinless life, die in our place, and rise from the grave, conquering death. And in doing so, he paid the price for our sin and gives us a right to everlasting life. The good news is that all humanity will experience God's presence and power. He is not limited to the four walls of the church. The good news is that the Christ and culture mantle means he has raised up this house as a place of calling, building, preparation, and sending. We're not going to be with you when you're witnessing on your job or in your home. And that is good news too. But God will. Which makes today a good day to serve, to surrender, and to follow him. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you'd like to do that, I'd like to pray with you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'd like to pray for you. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. If you need truth, I want to pray with you. Thank you, brother. I see that hand. All you need to do is raise your hand. If you've walked with Jesus and walked away, I want to pray with you. All you need to do is raise your hand. If you're feeling that hunger, that that discontent, that sense that there is something more, that sense that you need to chase him and you're you're, you're struggling with how, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to take one step of faith. Come down to this altar so that the church can pray for you together. Beloved, let us applaud them. Let us encourage them as they come. We're praying today for healing. We're praying today for freedom. We're praying today for hope. We're praying today for transformation. We're praying today for new seasons. We're praying today that God will do something in the life of his people that we've never seen him do before. Beloved, it's a new season. It's a brand new day, and they are coming now. Beloved, let us continue in this moment to encourage them. Let us continue in this moment to celebrate what God is doing, what God is doing in the life of individuals, what God is doing in the life of the church, what God is doing in the life of the church sent out into the culture. Beloved, change starts with a move here, but it doesn't end there. Thank God that we can't limit what God is doing. Let us give God praise because we don't know where these people are headed, but we know that we can come into agreement right now with what God is doing in their life, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. And agreement is the place of power. So let us agree in this place. And let us give him praise. Now, I'm going to lead two prayers. First is a prayer of salvation, and the second is a prayer of rededication. And I'm just going to ask you to repeat after me. If you're coming for the first time, repeat after me. Father, and beloved, let us all support them. Father, I repent of my sin. I believe that Christ died on the cross and rose again to pay the price for my sin. I confess him. As Lord, As Lord and Savior. And, Savior. And, your word says, and your word says, I'm born again. I'm born again. I am your child. Your child. You are my God. Oh my God. I will never be perfect, never but I am forever changed. Forever changed. I pray in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Beloved, let us praise God for that. Now follow me in this prayer of rededication. Father, I thank you. That every day, day, your mercies mercies are new. new. I thank you you for new season. season. I thank you you for new days. days. I thank you you that if we confess confess our sin, sin, you are faithful faithful and just just to forgive us us 
forgive us and cleanse us and cleanse from all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. Thank you for restoration. Thank you for restoration. Thank you for renewal. Thank you for renewal. Thank you for revival. Thank you for I pray I in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Let us give God praise. Hallelujah. Family, if you prayed uh, that prayer, we believe you are born again. If you prayed rededication, we believe God is starting a new season in you. But change is not an event. It's a process. Now the journey in Christ begins. It deepens. It resumes. Now we become representatives of God's rule in the world. And we get to discover what our gifts, talents, and abilities are for and what we were created to do. I need you, beloved, to do four things. And anybody watching online to do four things as well. Begin, resume, continue to study the word. Second, get in a Bible teaching church. Three, keep showing up. And four, tell someone about the decision that you made for Christ. Yeah, and now, yeah, sure. for those of you here, I just want you to turn around because we just want to take this moment and celebrate you. Welcome. There are some people who have been praying for you. They've been waiting for you. And they can't wait to see what God will do in your life. Amen, amen, amen. May God continue to bless you, beloved. Your life will never be the same. Hallelujah. And now you may be seated. Amen. Come close. <laughs> wow, welcome for those who dedicated. If you're viewing online, there's, there's, there was a number on the bottom of the screen. Please call. We have individuals that want to share with you what you just participated in. Uh, and I always say it, it's not easy, but it's possible. It's a journey. But I love the journey because it's the journey where we find ourselves being forged to become the individual to appreciate the destination. So, is there anything else? I'm, I'm trying to get the email address. I know. <laughs> he, he's connected <laughs> to comments and other things that are coming at him while yes. he's there. So he's listening to me and sorting through uh, text messages that he's getting with questions about what's going on and comments. So, yeah. so um, we're working on an email uh, for if anybody had questions, especially about the prophetic questions about uh, how that yes, operates yeah. and functions, yeah. we want to be able to uh, get them to submit it. Uh, I know one of the email addresses, I'm not sure if this is the exact email address, uh, and, but it's media at cccinfo.org. That's one. But I think the, the generic email, cccinfo.org. So if you were here last week and uh, you have any questions about what took place prophetically, especially in the next service, you can email us your questions or comments at cccinfo.org. All right? You can go to our website and it will give you some instruction. And we'll be prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Amen. Good. Amen. All right. Sounds good. Were you blessed today? You can stand up again so we can close. Jesus created the church, community, family, so that we can grow together and we can learn together and we can also care for each other. That's important. This is the context. You don't grow in isolation. You grow in community. That's what the church is all about. So continue to pray for our church, our ministry around the world. Continue to pray for us as leaders. Uh, this is the first time we ministered together in about five weeks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. I love <laughs> ministering with this guy right here. Praise the Lord. Um, the team is good. So the, the email is questions, with an S, questions, at cccinfo.org. Ooh, cool. I like that even better. Questions, plural. Yes, questions. At cccinfo.org. Info. Did they just make they just that up? They just made it up. Ooh. Yep, the team is great. That's our staff. Yes. That is our staff. <laughs> Responding to the need. Amen. So, as we leave this place. But never God's presence. Jesus, Jesus is Lord, period. period. We, we believe, believe it, it. We proclaim it. And we're, and we're seeing, seeing it come, come to pass. pass. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Family, thank you so much for watching CCC's YouTube channel. If you feel what you just experienced impacted your life in any way, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this video with others so we can fulfill our mission in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We welcome you to check out some of our other videos. 
Also, make sure to click the notification bell so you are the first to know when we post a new one. Our praise and worship team brings us a powerful and dynamic live worship experience every Sunday. And trust me and Cameron when I say you do not want to miss it. Streaming times are in the description box below. And if you are looking for any other information about what's happening here at CCC, visit www.cccinfo.org. We hope to see you next Sunday, but for now, continue to have a blessed week in the Lord.